And now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome and introduce your Dean and Chancellor, Dr. Joseph Flaherty. Good morning. Hold it. Good morning, doctors. Welcome to the commencement ceremony of Ross University School of Medicine, the 58th commencement. Please be seated. On behalf of the School of Medicine and the Board of Trustees, I welcome you. Today is all about you, the graduates. There are over 500 of you here today, representing 46 states, nine Canadian provinces, among you are citizens of 45 countries of the, other than the United States. At the end of today's proceedings, you will join more than 10,000 physicians, and I think we'll have the 11,000 and two uh, graduated today. I'd first, before I speak, like to acknowledge those of you who are joining us on live broadcast on the internet. We're thrilled to share this day with you. Again, congratulations. This is a great day and an honor for you and for us. I want to welcome members of my cabinet and administration. We're pleased to see the faculty that helped get you through it here in attendance, but mostly, as I said, it's about you. To paraphrase a former president, to those of you that are receiving highest honors and high honors and awards, I say, job well done. To the average student, I say, you too can be a chancellor or a dean or faculty member. <laughs> Winston Churchill once said, the pessimist sees difficulty in every opportunity. The optimist sees opportunity in every difficulty. You, class of 214, are clearly the optimist. You have surmounted every obstacle. You have succeeded because you did not take no for your dream. You persevered and developed endurance and resilience and a can-do spirit. You have true grit. Many of you took courses after college, several MCATs attempt, hundreds of med school applications. You got into Ross. Suddenly, you were transported with many delays to that beautiful Emerald Isle on the long, winding road to Portsmouth, the endless days of orientation, finding a place to stay with Wi-Fi, learning to live on bare essentials while getting a fire hose of medical education aimed at you. You survived anatomy lab, biochemistry, pharmacology, comp step one, rush to Miramar, more training, dozens of hospitals across the country, endless nights of call, hours of study, step exams, countless match application and interviews, and here you are. You persevered and become better from, for it. You are now doctors. And with this resilience and perseverance and grit, seeing opportunity and taking it, this is what it means to be a Ross graduate. So I say, carpe diem, seize the moment, seize the day. Many of you have not had a break since kindergarten. <laughs> Many of you have destined your whole life around this point in time Take a moment to savor the moment. This is your day. Share it with your parents, share it with your friends, but please enjoy it. I ask you to look around also to your classmates that you've been with for so long and see the great diversity that is the Ross University School of Medicine, the nights you've spent working with each other, learning about each other, you are naturals for doctors of the world community. Yours is a generation that will move beyond the old us versus them and on to we. we have, many have displayed in medicine, or talked about in medicine, or you read in the papers, that medicine is a difficult pro profession. Some of you have been cautioned, even by your parents, 
There's all the insurance forms and complicated things and medical malpractice. I wouldn't listen to the naysayers. Medicine is as great today as it was 100 years ago when I graduated. <laughs> Let me tell you why. It is the single best combination of science and practicing humanity. We're in a new golden era of medicine with great new treatments developed by the genome and pharmacology and many options, things that you can actually use in the care of cancer and heart disease and stroke. The practice of medicine is also moving from the individual solo practice to large groups. There's a good caveat in that. You may be able to have a life, one of the first generations of physicians to do so. I encourage you to do it. Find out who you are, what you like, what you want to do. Find people you love to share it with and enjoy it because you have that opportunity. You're given the privilege and an honor, as you were 100 years ago, to enter into the intimate life of a patient, to have them tell you their hopes, their fears, their concerns, things that they might tell no other person in their life. It is a great honor, it's a great privilege, and enjoy it. Now, finally, I've reached the age where I think I can give a few words of wisdom, and they're not that wise, but it's still I'm gonna offer them. Um, I always thought that was something for older people to be able to do. Now I realize I'm one of those older people. Uh, I ought to know something just to start because I know all of you are very tech-savvy millennials, so I give you one word of caution. You need to know that Siri cannot do a blood draw for you at 3 a.m., you cannot tweet your way to good patient care, and there is no app for finding a good life-work balance. Second, take ownership of your life. Now is the time. Yes, you've got to follow the rules of the training program you're in, but you can also start thinking what you want with your life. Third, practice humility. Do never be afraid to ask for help. Never be afraid to say, I don't know. Never be afraid to say, I'm sorry, when you've done something wrong. It is something that has been widely received by patients. Practice acceptance. The first thing you'll have to accept I hate to tell you this after all the years of training, but when you go into a hospital, the nurses know more than you do. <laughs> They're your friend. You want to get a little sleep at night, be their friend. And, and also listen to what they have to say. Medicine is a team sport. Practice lifelong learning. After you see patients, during the day, you're going to have to go home and read about them at night. It's the only way it works. It doesn't matter if you do it electronically or you have something in your ear or you talk to friends. You've got to learn about what you've seen. Practice prevention. We are moving into a great era of prevention. I'm sure Dr. Carmona will speak more about it, but as in his words, we're gradually moving from a sick care system to a healthcare system. Final piece is never underestimate the importance of social support. Don't forget your family. Don't use the excuse to miss weddings and birthdays and other events because I'm a doctor. Stay connected. The same people that brought, got you here are the same people that are gonna help you go further. To quote the artist Gary Bolding in a graduation address some years ago, your families are extremely proud of you. You can't imagine the sense of relief they are experiencing. This may be the last opportune time to ask for money. <laughs> Let me again close with the immortal words of Sanka Coffey, the character in Cool Runnings, the true story of the Olympic Jamaica bobsled team. 
We didn't come this far or work this hard to forget who we are or where we come from. Your Ross University School of Medicine graduates, be proud, be loud, congratulations. It is my pleasure now to introduce our guest speaker, Richard Carmona, MD, MPH, Fellow of the American College of Surgeons, served as Surgeon General of the United States from 2002 to 2006. Dr. Carmona is a member of the Board of Trustees of Ross University School of Medicine and a distinguished professor at the Mal and Enid Zuckerman College of Public Health at the University of Arizona. Dr. Carmona has worked in various positions in the medical field, including paramedic, registered nurse, and physician. Once a high school dropout and a youth who suffered homelessness and hunger, Dr. Carmona enlisted in the U.S. Army and became a combat-decorated Special Forces Vietnam veteran. He went on to earn his B.S. and M.D. with highest honors at the University of California, San Francisco. Trained in general and vascular surgery, Dr. Carmona completed a National Institutes of Health sponsored fellowship in trauma, burns, and critical care. He then was recruited jointly by the Tucson Medical Center and the University of Arizona to start Arizona's first regional trauma center. After his tenure at Surgeon General, he returned to the University of Arizona as a first distinguished professor of public health and a professor of surgery and pharmacy practice. He is a recipient of numerous military, police, and academic awards and decoration. I am pleased and humbled to introduce to you Dr. Richard Carmona and in invite him to the podium. Dr. Carmona. That's a wonderful presentation. Good morning, Joe. Thank you for the nice introduction, but I, I always feel a lot like uh, Ricky used to say to Lucy, you got a lot of explaining to do. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't engender a lot of confidence in our students and faculty when they hear their Surgeon General is a high school dropout. <laughs> but it, it does say how great our nation is and all of the opportunities that we all have. So Dean Flaherty, academic leaders and faculty, Thank you for the invitation to be with you and participate in this joyous occasion. To the students, I am extremely grateful for the privilege and opportunity to provide your remarks. <sighs> that I hope will give you pause, as well as inspire you to rise to our global challenges and provide insightful, innovative, and entrepreneurial solutions to a wide array of national and global needs that continue to elude our past and present national leadership. And of course, I would be remiss if I did not thank and congratulate all the moms, dads, families, and significant others who have made this day possible for all of our students. I am thrilled today to speak to you about a Surgeon General's perspective of global threats and exceptional opportunities and what this means to each and every one of you. As Surgeon General, you have a unique vantage point. You sit at the seat at a table as history is being made, for better or worse. A seat that only 16 United States Surgeon Generals occupied before me in the entire history of our nation. The statutory job description of the Surgeon General of the United States is to protect, promote, and advance the health, safety, and security of the United States. On paper, a very simple, straightforward description. In reality, a perpetually embattled position in an increasingly partisan battlefield. For the Surgeon General is not the Surgeon General of the Democratic or Republican parties. The Surgeon General has a much more important job. The Surgeon General is the doctor of the people of our great nation, whose words and advice are guided by the best science available and not partisan rhetoric. Think about the partisan battles that you've all heard about, around stem cells, abortion, Plan B, terrorism, weapons of mass destruction, and national and global preparedness. These are scientific and not political issues to a Surgeon General. Due to the aforementioned and so much more, Surgeon Generals are known to age in dog years while in office. 
There is no formal or special preparation available to ascend to the position of Surgeon General of the United States. However, my greatest asset was probably being very naive and believing I could change the world, stamp out disease, famine, pestilence, and social injustice, and do so much more. More or less like each and every one of you feel today as you leave with your diplomas and being designated as, as physicians. In fact, in one of my very early mentorship meetings with my predecessor, Surgeons General, I had been reviewing national statistics of disease and economic burden. I expressed my concern to them about the troubling and increasingly poor U.S. health metrics and cost of care. I jokingly said to all the Surgeon Generals present, what did you guys do during your tenures? Why did you leave it all for me? Surgeon General Coop piped up and said, son, you'll understand soon. And he was so correct. Up to that point, the intricacies of the juxtaposition of global and national health issues and politics had eluded me. Now as a battle-scarred Surgeon General, I'm here to tell you that as you graduate, you are now born into the real tumultuous world of this new millennium. You also enter a world that anxiously awaits you. Our nation desperately needs and is in search of new leadership with world knowledge, global commitment, and a willingness to challenge the norm, the politically correct, the status quo, to break the political gridlock, to serve the people and not a party, to rise above the political fray, and as Spike Lee once said, just do the right thing. Will you be that agent of change? One person can make a difference. The threats and challenges before us as a nation do not respect our geopolitical borders. Think about global warming, emerging infections, famine, food insecurity, social injustice, wars, terrorism, and much more illustrate this. As with global health, terrorism also has inextricable links to the social determinants of health, and therefore there is an opportunity for us to be involved in mitigating or preventing terrorism. The genesis of terrorism begins with asymmetries of health, asymmetries of wealth, ideology, theology, and poor governance. So how do we leverage health in this global environment, not only as a tool to improve health globally, but also to engender economic development, peace and prosperity, which are all vaccines against terrorism? While on active duty, most of my fellow admirals and generals agree that we need a strong military, but it needs to be used judiciously. For we now know that we can't impose democracy or win hearts and minds by shock and awe, we should realize that our nation prospers and does best when it inspires others and not when it attempts to intimidate. Health diplomacy is a tool that, when used prospectively, has the ability to eradicate the asymmetries of health, wealth, ideology, and theology, and in doing so, potentially make the world a safer place with less civil unrest. Our UN's foreign policy needs to continue to evolve the concept of health diplomacy. Paradoxically, I believe that our nation's best foreign policy export in history is not any government program, but actually rather Sesame Street. For over 40 years, they have continually and sustainably exported unbiased, nonpartisan messages of health, peace, tolerance, and prosperity globally in hundreds of languages and dialects around the world. I would say the Muppets are indeed exceptional ambassadors. Our nation must continue to strive to lead multilaterally, partnering with our allies and adversaries for the stakes are far greater than our U.S. interests. The preservation and prosperity of civil society and the globe is our mandate. You have the privilege to live in a democracy. Although imperfect and frustrating at times, it represents the best the world has to offer. For opportunity abounds here. I know firsthand, as the oldest son of poor immigrant parents, who dropped out of high school, as did my brothers and sister. My mom's main goal, she used to say in Spanglish, was to live long enough to see one of her kids graduate. And she only meant high school because no one in the family had gone that far. But because of second chances in a land of opportunity, I eventually succeeded, got a GED, military college, medical school, graduate school, professorships, and ultimately United States Surgeon General. Ain't it a great country? <laughs> Our nation has been at war for over a decade in two major theaters globally, all within a world of shifting alliances, often driven by ideological, theological, or economic motivations. 
Look out at the world today, not just your community or our country, for your neighborhood now is the world. A world where the definition of superpower is being rewritten, where social media has recently been shown to possibly be the ultimate weapon for disenfranchised populations. A world where we see ourselves as good, caring, compassionate, honest, concerned citizens, but a world that sometimes sees us as isolationists, practicing colonialism under the guise of democracy, and even occasionally heavy-handed and unilateral. I would submit to you that for the privilege of your education, for the gift of citizenship you have, you also ha now have the social, moral, and ethical responsibility and go forth, and from your unique vantage points as physicians, make the world a healthier, safer, cleaner, and more secure place. Work to eradicate social injustice globally, help extinguish health disparities, create dialogue, preach tolerance and mutual respect to begin to remove the asymmetries that lead to disenfranchised populations using tools like terrorism. Work to enhance our nation's global image so we continue to inspire. Welcome and embrace diversity, for paradoxically, although diversity sometimes divides us, it is our nation's greatest strength. And last but not least, keep your dreams beyond your reach and your integrity above reproach. For your nation and the world are hungry for informed, honest, passionate, innovative, inspirational, nonpartisan, and rational leadership. As Gandhi said, be the change you wish to see in the world. And to paraphrase Winston Churchill, who said, I love Americans. They always do the right thing, eventually. <laughs> eventually is here, and you are our future. Go change the world. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Carmona. Uh, we will now bestow degrees earned by the students of Ross University School of Medicine as recommended by the faculty to the Board of Trustees. Board members, I certify to you that each candidate presented the official graduation list has completed all the requirements for the degree of Doctor of Medicine. Therefore, in accordance with the will of the Board of Trustees, we are honored to bestow upon these graduates the degree of Doctor of Medicine. The candidates will now receive a diploma signifying the degree and all the dignitaries, rights, privileges, and protections belonging to it. As the candidates come on stage, they will be hooded by Dr. Dobby, Weaver, Sharma, and Lavani. Each candidate will then be hand their seating card to Dr. Wales or Fernandez, and their names will be announced by Drs. Wales or Fernandez. Then one at a time, each student will cross the stage to receive his or her degree from myself. I will offer a congratulatory handshake, at which time a fo photograph will be taken. I will then congratulate each student as they walk off the stage. Boy, they got this really tracked down exactly. <laughs> right hand, left hand, okay. Let me keep with the script. Members of the 58th graduating class of Ross University School of Medicine, the hooding ceremony will now begin.